Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of what is the Arsenal Transfer Show, episode 250. We've been doing this for a long time now. That's uh, not to include the episodes of the Arsenal News Show. I think we're closing in on 500 8 a.m. episodes of this, which is kind of incredible. Um, but good morning to everybody joining us in the chat box and those catching up, of course, on visual and audio platforms as well. Uh, good morning in the chat box to Black Shine, to Matt G, to Harvey, to Vivian. I mean, Matt G may have been the person to leave the first live chat comment on the first Arsenal transfer show. That that might be true. It might also be very wrong, but it might be true. Stevie, good morning to you. Steve and Dave, uh, Black Shine says, Tom, do you think we'll go back for Dusan Vlaovic? We'll get there. Don't worry, we'll get there. Tony, good morning to you. Amira, good morning. Olu, Red Star and Jose Lynn. Good morning, guys. Uh, good morning to Temi and Marcus, of course, as well. Um, morning, Tom. Morning, Gooners. Smash the like as you enter the chat just to say good morning. It makes sense, does it not? It does indeed, Dan. Thank you so much for the kind support. As always, people, do drop your finger onto that like button. It really does help out the channel and helps out everything else to send this around the world to even more people. And subscribe if you're new. I did a quick check on the uh, analytics yesterday, and apparently 60% of the people that watch the show are subscribed, which means 40% are fr freeloading. Freeloading fools. <laughs> drop a button on that. Drop drop a button. Well, I mean, if you, maybe you've not got the button. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe you'd have to create it. But if it is there, then you can press it. Just press that subscribe button for me as we work our way towards 41,000. But the journey to 50,000 subscribers is uh, is very much in full swing. Um, let's, uh, let's kick off by first saying, of course, that yesterday released our uh, our Eat, Sleep, Repeat Arsenal podcast. If you haven't yet given that a watch, make sure you do. Definitely worth your time. It was a really uh, it was a really interesting watch uh, once again. And listen to kind of Dr. Raj talking in depth and in detail about... Uh, we did a little bit of coverage on kind of what you can do in and around the home whilst there's snow outside, which, of course, for most of us there is down here in the south there's been snow outside for the last few days but we also went into gabriel jesus uh we also talked about the world cup and more stuff as well so make sure you go and check it out it was a really good listen anyway uh, our first story uh is another plug uh, another unashamable plug but yesterday i wrote a piece that's gone out this morning which went into kind of the y scout tactical analysis of eddie and ketia's performance in the last two uh, friendlies against Leon AC Milan. It goes into statistical detail and analytical detail about specifically um, the fact that he's kind of adopting this new role, I guess. You know, he's playing striker, sure, but there are a lot of similarities to Gabriel Jesus's play. Uh, and I go into some of the evidence about, uh, backing that up and showing why maybe we should be more encouraged uh, in Eddie and Ketia as well. So do make sure you go and give that a read. Link to the article is in today's video and audio description. Um, William Saliba reached the semi final. Reached the final. Sorry, he won the semi final. Well, he wasn't on the field to be fair, but his uh, France side won uh, quite comfortably. I say comfortably. It wasn't comfortable if you were a France fan, but the. Scoreline certainly suggests it was comfortable uh, and France made it through to the final to play Argentina after a 2-0 victory over Morocco. Morocco were, I think, unfortunately, I think Morocco gave absolutely everything uh, in that game. They just couldn't score. Like They had created so many chances, so many chances at this stage um, that you're like, surely you have, you have to take at least one of them. Uh, there was a great run. I think it was from Hamdala through the middle and into the box. And he had two opportunities to strike it with his left foot. And paused at both. And it's in those you're like, you've got to take that. You've got to, you've got to strike the ball at some stage. And uh, he didn't. And ultimately, uh, Morocco go out as the most successful World Cup uh, African side. The only African nation to ever reach the semifinals of a World Cup, which is in itself an amazing achievement. And we hope to see more African nations making it through the competition uh, as well. So look forward to seeing more of that. Pablo Marie have returned to training with Monza. Of course, he was the victim of a stabbing in a Italian shopping mall uh, not so long ago, uh, but he has now recovered uh, to the point where he can now return to training, which is good. Of course, Arsenal have a obligation, well, 
I mean, Monza have the obligation to buy uh, Pablo Marie out of his loan deal if they do indeed stay up. And they are quite clear of the relegation zone in Serie A. So there is a good chance that Monza will indeed end up purchasing Pablo Marie in the summer. Uh, Fulham still supposedly want to sign Cedric Suarez from us in January. There was inquiries made about the right back in the summer. These have continued forwards and it could be that Fulham try and take away Cedric from Arsenal in the January window. What I have to say about this is from my understanding, Cedric is still very, very happy at Arsenal. Even though he's not playing loads, it still means that he, he wants to be part of the squad. Uh, but I know that there's a lot of Arsenal fans that would be more than happy to see Arsenal take some money uh, for Cedric in January. What I would say is that he is really our only offensive-minded fullback on the right-hand side that we have. Both White and Tommy Asu, of course, are more disciplined, defensive-styled right-backs. So if we wanted to change things tactically, he is really the only person we have for that. That said, I have been asking Arsenal to really try and maybe go out and look for a senior right-back who can offer us more and we also have the uh, the uh, Brooke Norton Cuffey situation as well. But that, of course, won't be resolved until at least the summer when we'll find out more about what will happen with his future. Uh, now, Dusan Vlaovic, uh, the ship has sailed uh, with him. Uh, despite there being links to Dusan Vlaovic, reports suggesting that that ship has sailed. Arsenal are not interested in doing this deal. There is suggestions that they were very unhappy with what happened last January, with the attempts that was made to try and sign and get in touch with his representatives. And still, despite there being some breakthroughs with talks, it really didn't progress all that much. And there was frustration around this deal. And despite the fact that he might be on the market and maybe even regretting his move to Juventus and not choosing Arsenal last January, yeah, that ship has very much sailed. And there is not a chance that we will be signing Vlaovic. However... We will potentially be seeing Vlaovic and the Emirates very soon because, of course, Arsenal do play against Juventus on Saturday. Looking forward to this game. Hopefully, as many of you can attend this game as possible, even though there is ridiculous travel restraints, of course, with no trains in operation. But fingers crossed, Dusan Vlaovic will still be there. Uh, he did get knocked out in the group stage. There's a great chance, if he is indeed fit, that he will be involved and present at the Emirates on that very day. Um, the race still remains open, Joao Felix, but the price remains the obstacle for Arsenal. Uh, the only way in which Arsenal are ever going to have a hope of selling Joao Felix this winter is if they can somehow manage to agree a loan deal with Atletico Madrid. That might need to include a very sizable obligation to buy a clause that will be activated in the summer. We'll have to wait and see. We'll keep you updated on this story. But reports are, as of yesterday, that the race is very much open. There are some suggestions that Arsenal are said to be leading this race. Some suggestions saying that that is certainly not the case and that Mudrick remains the priority. Speaking of which, Mikhailo Mudrick, uh, the Shakhtar Donetsk uh, directors have come out and spoken. And they spoke to The Athletic in which they told The Athletic that uh, the process at the moment for potentially Arsenal or any other club at this moment in time is still very much there to be taken advantage of in, in some ways because they've hold talks with players, as we've heard. And despite the fact that Arsenal were it seemingly put off by the huge fee, they haven't necessarily been put off enough to try and convince themselves they can get that price down. Uh, asked by uh, The Athletic, The Athletic did a interview with uh, Palkin, who is one of the uh, directors, the C sorry, the CEO, uh, Sergei Palkin, over the potential of signing Mikhailo Mudrik. He said, to be honest, I do not know at the moment. We are quite far from what we want and what clubs propose. It's not so far, but it's not what we need. We have discussions and one club, another club, they negotiate. We are in the process. Will it close this month? I don't know. It is maybe 50-50 with regards to this winter transfer window. I don't want to talk about the figures now. We are in discussions. We have interest from some English clubs and we are in the process. How ironic. Uh, we're using these words like process. So as Anton says, we're just going to have to trust the process at this stage with this one and keep our fingers crossed that indeed Shakhtar Donetsk will agree a fee with Arsenal. The key quote that I take from that discussion is the words where he says, it's not so far, but it is not what we need. So it seemingly is that the figures that are being discussed between clubs with Arsenal said to be very much leading the race and the priority for Mudrik and the club seeing Mudrik as the priority for them, that they aren't so far off. That's a really good sign. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm very, very hopeful that Arsenal can get this deal done. Because if they can't, 
I really wonder who on earth we're going to be getting in that January window. Uh, one player I don't expect it to be, but yet uh, there remains to be several stories about him. And our headline story of the day is that according to Italian reports, yes, everyone needs to gulp down their drinks of their hopium. Uh, according to Italian reports, the groundwork has supposedly been laid for Arsenal to move for Sergei Milinkovic-Savic in the summer. Um, <laughs> I can already see the smiles merging across your face. I still cannot see Sergei Milinkovic-Savic joining Arsenal ever. Uh, it just seems too good to be true that that would ever happen. But reports are emerging that apparently the 40 to 50 million euro price tag that has significantly fallen to that from what it was previously 60 to 70 has allowed the groundwork to be laid for a potential move by Arsenal for Milinkovic-Savic in the summer. I really would love it to happen, but I just can't believe these reports. I just can't get my head around the consistent link, the consistent talk of Arsenal being interested. I just would like it to move somewhere in the summer just so that we kind of get this story off our back, if you will, and that we can stop discussing it. You know what will happen now. Um, Linkovic Savage will go and join Arsenal in the summer and I'll look like a right idiot now, but uh, I'll be more happy than anything. But uh, I really, really... I can't. Uh, I can't. Anyway, Fuad says, and I know some people have also shared this opinion of Fuad, who says, Moretto is actually a very good reporter, Tom, and mainly works with Spanish outlets, although he is Italian himself, and this has more legs. And I have heard this, uh, you know, saying that Moretto is reporting this story is very much well connected on this. Let's see. Let's see if it changes or happens in the summer. But there's always kind of this... It's this underlying doubt around whether the Italian press outside of, of course, Fabrizio report these stories. So we'll see if things change. And I'll keep you updated with this one. But uh, I have to report it because it's been reported pretty much everywhere now. Uh, and it's been picked up by a lot of different places. But uh, we will comment on its legitimacy. And I can't quite yet see it happening. Anyway, we'll move to the questions in part two right after this. Okay, let's uh, tackle some of your questions uh, in the chat box this morning. Uh, Wilson says, why on earth are the Vlaovic rumours rumbling on again? There is no way in hell that Dusan will be joining uh, because he rejected the Gunners last time and is not committed. Come on, man. Yeah, look, I report what I report because I see the story. We report the story. We talk about the story. It's as simple as that. That is the process of this show. Um, we're not sitting there going, he's joining Arsenal because that's what has been reported. We're sitting there going, this is what's been reported. I have my doubts about this. I think you should be very cautious about this story circulating. That's how we tackle it. That's how we discuss it. That's how I think you should look at it. Um, Manu says, uh, likelihood is that we sign someone completely different from the players that we're being linked with. Love it when Arsenal drop one of those uh, little nuggets of truth uh, in, in the kind of the market. I love it as well. You know, when Matt Ryan was signed out of completely nowhere, that was great when the Fabio Vieira deal last summer happened out of nowhere that was great um Callum Chambers leaving on a free not so great but did show that further reports you know can go very much under the radar uh and I really did enjoy that so I'm looking forward to hopefully that happening again because uh, it's always a good one what I would say is that these kind of discussions around players um do tend to allow us to kind of build up and maybe cover the story in more detail before they're announced but you can't help but love when something comes out of the blue. Uh, Daniel says, would it not be worth taking whatever FFP throw at us and go big in January to win the league? No, uh, I don't really want a transfer ban. Thank you. Uh, Balaj says, will you sell Cedric to Fulham? I won't. I have no control. <laughs> but if I was in control, I would be tempted to consider a decent fee. But it have to be a decent fee. If they're asking for like, you know, if we're looking at, three odd million quid I don't see how that's beneficial to us to be honest I'd rather just keep him to the end of the season and then sell him in the summer because I don't really see us signing a right back this winter I don't see that happening so unless they offer something well beyond what he's worth like upwards of five six seven million quid for Cedric then I'd be tempted but other than that I'm not that tempted right now Aaron says morning Tom is there a fee mentioned for Cedric no um 6.2 million pounds in wages would be saved if he's gone barely played a minute we would save a lot in wages sure um but I just think that that insurance policy in this specific season is really important to have so I don't really want to see Cedric move anywhere just yet uh, Sean says could you see Vieira transitioned into the Bukayo Saka role 
I think that he can play a number of positions. I don't think we're necessarily going to see a you know a legitimate transition to him being kind of this right right sided playmaker. I don't think that's where he will play in the future. I think he's going to become a bit of a uh, a jack of all trades, hopefully master of some rather than master of none. But I do see him more so as Erdegaard's competitor than I do see him as Bakaya Saka's competitor. Uh, Daniel says, would it not... Oh, we've already done that one. Let's go to Why So Gibrius, who says, uh, good morning, Tom. What do you think of Sandro Tonali? I think him and Tuchemeni are going to be the best DMs in football in the next four years. I mean, Tonali actually plays slightly ahead of the DM. Um, kind of plays, if he was to sign for us, I think he would play more so where Xhaka is playing right now than where Tuchemeni is necessarily playing in the deepest part of the midfield. So... I'm not necessarily sure if that, that fits, but I do think that Tonali is a, a very talented footballer. You don't tend to see Italian players leave Italy, as the saying goes. It just doesn't really happen. And I don't think he has any intention of leaving AC Milan at the moment. But who knows? Maybe we'll have to see if any strange things happen in the near future. Uh, NSW says, Tom, could you remind us, please, of who is on top of the Premier League? Uh, it's it's Arsenal. Mate. I nearly swore then. That was very close to a to an 8am swear. <laughs> very passionate about Arsenal being top at the moment. Uh, Francois says, Tom, when is the last time an Italian outlet gave us a statement that turned out to be reliable? Don't worry, I'll wait. Hmm. You may be waiting. I mean, Fabrizio, of course, is, is the key. Uh, but he's an individual reporter who works for CBS, of course which isn't an Italian outlet. I'm trying to think. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Maybe someone in the chat box can help us. Um, but I can't think of one off the top of my head that was, you know, that really got me grabbed and thought, wow, they've done really well with that story. But maybe I'm just being ignorant. Uh, Gunner King says, if you end up being disciplined for various elements of breaches of FFP rules, I'm not sure if it's actually FFP. I think it's kind of more, they're investigating kind of some weird, goings on in the transfer records uh, don't you think the club might look to take advantage of Juve's need to sell if relegated by going back in for him uh, they might end up taking advantage of something I don't know if it'll be Vlaovic I mean Chiesa and Locatelli stand out to me as better options for us but I, I don't necessarily see that happening at the moment I think it was going to take a long time um, for this kind of thing to have an impact but maybe January proves me wrong and we see a, a massive exodus of players uh, Vanaju says, is there any truth in the reports that the Indian billionaire allegedly is interested in buying Arsenal? I mean, I can't verify the reports that we've seen come out of the last 48 hours. What I can tell you is that the Cronkies have absolutely no interest in selling. Uh, no interest in selling at all. So even if there is interest in someone buying Arsenal, there is no interest from them in selling the club unless they receive an offer that is just stupidly above the valuation, um, which even then, I kind of use the example of what's an extra few billion to a billionaire. I, I don't know. Maybe the fa you know, the famous saying of, you know, I guess what we have that billionaires don't is enough. You know, and there's that satisfaction that people who are billionaires don't have, that are billionaires because they never felt anything. That a million wasn't enough, so a billion was next. And you know, one day we'll probably have a trillionaire because a billion wasn't enough. So maybe I'm wrong about that. But I always kind of use that theory of what's an extra billion to a billionaire. I'm not really sure. Uh, and that's why they don't really have to sell. Uh, Akmal says, Tom, uh, with France facing off against Argentina in the World Cup final, where is Arsenal at the Premier League table? <laughs> They're top. Uh, lovely stuff. Amira says, do you think why is slash will be officially our right back alongside Tommy going forwards? It would explain why we're targeting centre-backs, even with Trusty doing one on loan. Two new centre-backs as White and Holdings replacements. Um, we're not really targeting any right-sided centre-backs, to be fair. It's more so a player like Evan and Dika that's being linked because we're going to lose Pablo Marie and because Holding, who plays on the left-hand side more than more than most, I think that as a right-footed player, he plays on the left-hand side more than most. I think that that leans into it. Right-back, I think, is an area that we are still looking at as potentially a pathway for some of our youth players, like Raul Waters, like Brooke Norton Cuffey, for instance. Um, so I think that there is options there. I don't know if permanently White is considered a right back. I think he's considered a player that can play both right back and centre back. And Arteta really appreciates players that can play in multiple positions. I think that's probably the bigger truth surrounding this one. Um, Yoni says, uh, do you think that we should be looking for an upgrade on Xhaka in midfield like Milinkovic Savic or a high potential young player in that role who can take over from Xhaka in a couple of seasons? We absolutely should always be looking to upgrade. You know, we can't get attached to players too much that we think that we aren't able to get someone better than it's already there. Xhaka's done brilliantly well and it's going to be very, very difficult to find somebody 
that can give you an upgrade on him. You know, I've said that I think if you sign a midfielder in January, it should be Tielemans. He's Premier League ready. You know, he comes straight in. He's not going to need any time to transition, to be honest. And he's a competitive player in the Premier League playing in that position. So I have not really got an issue too much with that. I know some people don't really like the Tielemans story and think he's too slow or too lazy. I don't necessarily buy into that anywhere near as much as I would do you know, stories we've heard about players that aren't good enough and then turn out to be pretty darn good for the club. Um, I think that his his style maybe is not a lack of days because I think that is harsh. I think that movement is important, but I think that pace isn't necessarily the same level of importance as it is, say, on FIFA. You know, <laughs> so I use the example of everybody needs to have 80 pace or more when they play in midfield, apparently. Um, but uh, Tielemans, for me, I think would be a really good addition to midfield in January. Um, Savic, again, I'd be very surprised if that happens. Uh, very, very surprised indeed. Uh, three points says technically Unahi is above Amrabat. I would really like to see uh, be proved wrong, but Eddie ain't convincing me. Uh, as I said, if you want to give my piece a read, it is down in the description. I did a piece looking at Eddie and Ketty's performances against Leona and uh, AC Milan and talking in a lot of detail about how tactically he's kind of really improved his game uh, in quite a significant number of ways it is available for you to read in uh, and on football.london so do go and check that out link in the description but and he's not convincing a lot of people and i understand that he's got to convince people with his performances hopefully he can do that in the new year and of course before we even get to the new year against west ham and against brighton uh max says uh tom the felix the felix fee can be lowered if pepe is included in the deal i think pepe would kick on in the spanish league it's a win-win i'm not sure we can eat, i'm not sure about how that happens in january we'd have to recall pepe and then agree atletico madrid to sign him uh there's no certainty that he'd even fit into what simeone wants you know he's, they signed thomas lamar that didn't go well uh, i'm not necessarily sure they're looking for these types of players anymore um but maybe Maybe he proves to be the player that they need to go out and sign. We'll have to wait and see. Um, Manu says, did you know that Cedric is actually 31 and played at Inter Milan for a while? Yes, I did. I did know that. Uh, Bulgarian Guna says, is Milinkovic Savic overrated? Not impressed by his World Cup performances. Quoted price is ridiculous. I wouldn't say look at his World Cup performances. I would say go and look at his entire career. Uh, he's not overrated at all. Um, he did score in the World Cup for Serbia. A Serbian side that I wasn't particularly pleased when I watched them, in fairness. I think there is a lot of lacking pieces into the puzzle of that Serbian side. So uh, I'd recommend going and watching him at club level for Lazio because I he's a world class player in my view. There is there's little uh, that can convince me otherwise on that on that uh, train of thought, shall we say? Uh, Sag Sham says Savage is overrated. Needs a ton of time on the ball and just uh, one of those Serie A types. Again, I disagree significantly. I think he's a very very good player. Uh, Lynn says Tom, the ceiling of our players has gone up since the World Cup. At least now we can see if we were to sell them that we would be making a profit rather than losing money. You know, I've said this for a while. That's the that's the change that we've seen in the recruitment that we've made. You look at all the players we've signed, and I think that most, if not all of them, have gone up in value. I think if we were to sell Lokonga, we'd get more than 15 million for him. If we were to sell Nuno Tavares, we'd get more than 7 million for him. If we were to sell Martin Odegaard, we'd get more than 30 million. If we were to sell Ben White, I don't think we'd be looking to accept a fee anywhere close to what we bought him for, to be honest. He's an English centre-back that can play right back really well. I think he's, you know, exceeded now expectation and he's done very, very well. William Saliba signed for 27 million, priceless. Priceless now. Aaron Ramsdale signed for around 30 million, worth more as a goalkeeper now, without a shadow of a doubt. Even Gabriel Jesus, I think, was a bargain at 45. And I think Zinchenko at 30 was a bargain at that fee as well. Um... The only one I think we're looking at right now is Fabio Vieira, thirty-four million pounds. He's got to justify that figure. That's that's the one I think you look at right now and go, I'm not sure uh, whether or not he's going to fulfil that investment. We'll have to wait and see. But he's certainly got the talent to be able to do it. He's just now got to be able to apply that talent on the pitch. Uh, Akaka says, "Hi Tom. Question: Why can't we just forget about the past and sign Vlaovic as our striker? He is just the perfect kind of striker that Arsenal would require and probably maybe desperate to leave Juve." Um, I don't think it's necessarily as simple as just it being about the history between the player and the club. Stylistically, I don't think Vlaovic suits what we're trying to do. I don't think he suits the striker position that Arteta is trying to cultivate and has shown with the signing of Jesus what he wants and with promoting Nketiah as well and giving him a new contract. It's not as simple as going... 
forget the past because I think it's actually more of a stylistic barrier between Vlaovic and Arsenal than it is more so uh, a historical or social barrier between the club and the player. And I think he would cost a silly amount of money still, even though Juventus might want to be keen on selling some of their players. Um, let's go to Marcus says, do you have contact with Fabrizio Romano? It would be great to do a show with him and he's not, and he is one of the most reliable. Um, I mean, I've had contact with him in the past, but I, I would, I wouldn't, you know, be looking to, when we have guests on, let me put it this way. When I have guests on, uh, they come on of their own free will and time. Um, that's probably the best way to describe it and the most polite way to describe it. Um, and at this stage, you know, I'm not looking to invest uh, in, in you know, in that stage at the moment. So, uh, yes, that's that's why we've not had Fabrizio on the show at this stage. Plus, he's not going to tell us any more than he puts out on Twitter anyway. So I don't really see the worthy, you know, turnaround from that. Uh, Raf says, do you think Saliba not featuring much in the World Cup is a help or a hindrance in our negotiations? He hasn't played, uh, so not gone up, but also may feel he leaves to become a starter. Interesting. What are your thoughts? Um, I think that I think that the agent will use it as a bit of a, a leverage point to say that, look, he can probably move to Real Madrid, start, and then get into the French team in the next Euros. We haven't got any guarantees because you've got Canate there, you've got Upper Meccano there. They're going to be playing week in, week out for Liverpool and for Bayern Munich. How do we know that him playing for Arsenal is going to guarantee him a starting position in, in Didier Deschamps' side? We don't know. You know, we don't know whether or not that it's going to be out. So I think the agent will certainly use it as leverage. What I think Arsenal will say is that you've played week in, week out for the team that are sitting at the top of the Premier League, you know, and you are on that pathway to getting into the team again. At the end of the day, I think he started Canate and Varane and Upamecano because Upamecano and Varane are more experienced, slightly more experienced. They've played together as well. And Varane, of course, has that experienced leadership. I mean, you think about the Argentinian backline. Otamendi is 34. And if we were putting together a list of the best Argentina 11, I don't think Otamendi gets into many people's best Argentina teams. But because of the age he has and the experience that he has, he's so important. And it's the same way that Varane is with France. They have that experienced figurehead. It's probably the same reason why Southgate really brought in Harry Maguire. I mean, a lot of people said that that was a joke over someone like Fakayo Tomori. So I think that it will certainly be used by the agent as potentially leverage in asking for more and trying to get Arsenal to do more to convince him to sign. But ultimately, I think that there is still a good chance that he will sign a new contract. And I think that what we've shown, the commitment we've shown to him, the minutes we've given to him, that is enough. We, we can't do any more. You know, Arsenal cannot do any more than we have done with Saliba. We really can't. So if he decides not to extend, it's not because of what we've done, in my opinion. Now, we've managed that situation, I think, as best we could. We made one error in 2020 when we didn't loan him out when we should have done and he was stuck in the youth team. But I think we've moved past that. And I think we have done now as much as we can. Uh, we've done as much as we can uh, with, with Saliba to try and convince him to sign a new deal. We're top of the table. He's playing week in, week out. You know, we probably give him a very, very good pay rise. I think we've done everything that we potentially can right now. Uh, Kunda has also been brilliant as well, says Ben Nix. Absolutely, he has. Um, let's go to Aaron. He says, if Arsenal win the league, Saliba is with the team. Who's won the hardest footballing competition in the world? Uh, should want to sign, uh, were one of the most exciting young teams in the world as well. I mean, if he wins the World Cup, not really playing. I mean, there are some players that kind of look at that and will look at that medal and go, I've not earned this. And I have a feeling that Saliba will probably be one of those players. You know, I think he will be one of those players that looks at a World Cup winner's medal and go, have I earned this? Because I think he's a winner. I think his mindset is very much, of course, along the lines of he wants to play. And if he's not playing, he's not happy. He'll be thrilled that his, his nation has won the World Cup. But I still think there'll be part of him that is maybe frustrated that he didn't contribute as much as he could. And the only game that he did play in, they lost against Tunisia. So I think that will certainly bear on his mind somewhat. Uh Joe Mo Rowe says, hi, Tom. Uh, hypothetically speaking, if Arsenal doesn't sign anyone, where do you think they'll finish? Um, it's a good question. Because at the moment, you look at the you look at the team and you go, well, who's catching us? Who's who's going to catch us other than Man City? And you've got to think that we've opened such a gap. I think we're something like, what, is it how many 16 points from Chelsea? Is it that much? 
Let me have a quick look at the table. It's, I mean, look at the table in itself. It's a joy to be able to do. Uh, we're on 37 points. Chelsea are on 21. 16 points to Chelsea. Uh, 15 points to Liverpool. Um, we are 11 points to Manchester United. We are uh, 8 points to Spurs, having played a game less than them. Uh, and, of course, 7 points to Newcastle, having played a game less than them. And that game, of course, is against Manchester City. So that's something to consider. So you have to think about who is going to catch Arsenal at the top of the table right now. Um, you know, and that's the question. So if we don't sign anybody, I will be so disappointed. I'll be angry and I will feel as though we have wasted one of the best opportunities we have ever had as a club. Ever had as a club. But, you know, I think that there is... I think missing out on the Champions League would be cataclysmic. So I couldn't necessarily see that happening. So I think top four... We would still achieve if we didn't sign anybody. But I just think that injuries would start to get um, the better of us. Temi says we're not signing anyone. DR says zero signings in January. Uh, I know that your um, pessimism comes from the previous transfer window in January. I get that. I understand that. But don't you think it's about time that we start having some optimism around Arsenal Football Club? Don't you think it's about time that we start being positive about Arsenal Football Club and not being so cataclysmic and end of worldy. You know, I really, I really do. I am concerned for people's well being when you sit five points clear at the top of the table and still we're putting out negativity. Like I, I do genuinely worry for the well beings of some, you know, when we are putting out negative thoughts about this. Maybe it's because you, you're using the phrase of, you know, if you expect disappointment, then you won't be disappointed. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what you're doing. And I can I have somewhat respect for that point of view. You know, maybe you've been watching too much of the last Spider-Man film. Um, but uh, optimism is earned, says TJR. And I think we've earned optimism. I think you look at the project, you look at the, the journey of the past three, four years, you look at Arteta's tenure at the club, and you look at it, and I think we've learned, we've earned the right to be optimistic about what we can expect. I think you look at the signings that we've made in the course of the last three summers, and you look at the journey we've been on from 2020 of signing Gabriel and Partey as kind of the starting bedrock of the positivity. Did we make mistakes in that window? Yeah. You know, Willie had Alex Runison, you know, and we're still paying for that in some senses because we've still got Alex Runison at the club. We signed Cedric on a permanent deal. We signed Pablo Marie on a permanent deal. You go to 2021. And you look at 2021 and you go, the signings that we made, the shift in the in the age profile of signing Ramsdale, Tommy Asu, Ben White, Nuno Tavares, Sambi Laconga, and Martin Odegaard, 23 and under, all of them. And we sh- we dramatically shifted the, the age profile and what we were looking at with Arsenal Football Club to the other end of the spectrum to give us that ceiling, to give us that momentum. And then you look at this summer and you look at this summer and you go, Alexander Zinchenko, Fabio Vieira, Marquinhos, of course, Matt Turner, and Jesus is the key one. And I look at Jesus and Zinchenko as two Premier League winners, three or four, three, at least three time Premier League winners, right? And you look at that and you go, if Arsenal are going to become what they want to be, which is Manchester City, you're going to have to sign players that are on that level. And we've done that. And with the mentality and the history and the experience of winning titles, and that, and all of those, all of that business that we've done over the course of those three summer transfer windows, gives me confidence that we are making the right choices, that we are moving in the right direction. And it gives me the reason to be optimistic about this upcoming January transfer window. If at the end of this January transfer window, we sign nobody, I will be the first on the 1st of February to say, I am utterly disappointed, angry and frustrated with the club. I'll be the first one, you know, but I am right now being optimistic and very open and hopeful that we will attack this January window, that we will add quality to this team and that we will push towards what we want to achieve, which is, as we know, a a Premier League title. Uh, And that's what we want from this season. Sure, we can talk about Champions League qualification, but to be honest, it is Arsenal Football Club and we should be looking to try and achieve more than just Champions League qualification. So if we can try and go for a title, let's go for a title. Anyway, uh, we're going to wrap things up there because I've just tipped over half an hour and quite by quite a significant number of minutes now. Um, I will be back, of course, at 10 a.m. over on the Arsenal way. Uh, I may be back with a show this afternoon. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I have got a special show lined up for you tomorrow afternoon. 
uh, more about that uh, tomorrow. Uh, but I'm looking forward to welcoming a couple of long-time uh, admirers of the, not admirers of me. That's the wrong way to put it. Admirers uh, of, of Arsenal Football Club. And, uh, and certainly people that you know from other podcasts that have come on the channel before. So it's going to be a good chat, hopefully, tomorrow about all things Arsenal, transfers, fixtures, winter breaks, World Cups, all of that goodness. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I'll be back, of course, most importantly, tomorrow morning. Uh, do drop a like on the video. Do subscribe to the channel if you're new around here with those notifications turned on so you never miss a show. Have a fantastic day and I will see you very soon. And as always, up the Arsenal.